Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman here, and he's the best storyteller in the game, and it's time to sit back, relax, and have some laughs. Welcome to the mayor's office, and here's your host, Sean Casey. Boom, gents. We're back at it, brother. Yes. We are back. We are back at it. Just the, the guests just keep coming uh, into the mayor's office. And this guy for up for both of us, especially, you know, me going back to, you know, a young kid in the Cape and yep. you as a, as a young, not even producer, you're probably, you were probably following this guy's papers back at ESPN. I, back I, in the day. I got into this industry without question. The number one reason was because I wanted to one day be kind of like Peter Gammons. So this yes, is like exactly. one of the greatest well, things ever. Well, be, but before we bring him in, listen, this guy, um, is a great friend of ours, first off. That's first and foremost. But he's been a, one of the best journalists, magazine writer, Sports Illustrated, Boston Globe. He's also an author, broadcaster. He's now writing for The Athletic and uh, working for MLB Network with, 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 uh, with myself. Voted three-time National Sports Writer of the Year by the National Sportcaster Association. Inducted into Cooperstown, which is pretty good. That means you're, that means you're good at what you <laughs> do think? in 2005. And the chances are, man, if you – follow baseball and you love the sport like we do that you know the icon that peter gammons is and we're so grateful that he's here to share some of the wealth of knowledge and the stories that he has in the mayor's office with us so let's welcome our good friend peter gammons peter what's going on brother well listen i go back i remember the date july 23rd 1994 cape cod league all-star game in orleans and yes. um, so I'm going. I was going to throw out the first pitch. I was really excited, and and uh, but so I, I'm going through the, the scouts and so forth behind home plate. You know, maybe two hours before the game, and this couple of scouts stop me and go, "I mean, you're here for the home run hitting contest?" And I said, "Oh, sure. You know, it'll be fun." Um, and they said, "Can you believe? Can you believe that Todd Helton?" who's never hit a home run on the Cape. He doesn't have any power. What's he doing? In a- <laughs> Sean Casey's the best young hitter in the league. He should be, the- he should be in the home run hitting contest. Uh, it's just terrible. I'm going, uh, let me just sort of settle down and put my stuff down here. And, uh, and uh, we'll go on. And as it turned out, it was a windy day, a very strange windy day, wind coming from the West, which normally didn't happen in New Orleans. And, um, Actually, um, the Todd Helton won the home run hitting contest. Oh, wow. Two to one over Mike Glavin, now the coach. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, that's that's crazy. Yes. He had a lot of power, but he was but, a fly ball hitter. Wow. And the wind was blowing. <laughs> but anyway, it's the only one Helton ever won. One year he hit 42 homers, led the, led the league and everything in the National League, and they didn't invite him at the All-Star game into the home run hitting oh, contest. Gosh. Well, oh, see, this well, is why the fans are in for a treat today because Peter Gammons hasn't even gone to the big leagues yet. He's talking about like a 17 year old Todd Elton, <laughs> and his story is already amazing. So, this is going to be great. Hey, listen, there were great players in that. Darren Erstad was in that game, Sean Casey, yeah. uh, the, the new manager of the Oakland Athletics. Uh, yeah, um, w- w- was, was Mike Lowell in, was Mike Lowell in that game too? There was some yes, good he players. Was. That wow. summer, I mean, Peter, I, I tell you what. So, I want to take it back. For me, the Cape Cod League was like, I remember playing at University of Richmond, and so and you know you go play summer league games and in, in, in different leagues, and you're as a player you're hoping to get an invite to the to the Cape Cod League. And Saul Yaz, who uh, you know Saul's, you know I think I don't know if he's the commissioner of the Cape or you know has been a big influence in the Cape. He was like the president of Br- the Brewster Whitecaps then, and they invited me to play. And and uh, you know that summer I'm like, man, if I can play here in the Cape because there's so many scouts. I can, you know, I, I have a shot to play in the big leagues, and that was the year. It was Helton, Erstat, Mike Lowell. There was a lot of guys, Kotze, a lot of different guys there. But what's funny is when we got to the All-Star game, we were always, we were always like, man, if you get to the All-Star game, you got a shot to meet Peter Gammons <laughs> because he comes to Orleans to the game. And, and I tell you what, that was such a thrill for me and all the guys that have played in the Cape. You know, you were on baseball tonight. You were such a big icon in the game, and we were – you know, grateful to see you. So, but the Cape, Peter, you live on the Cape. And mm-hmm. for all the people that love the listeners don't know what the Cape Cod League, it's the best wood bat league out, collegiate wood bat league in the history of wood bat leagues. And if you go to the Cape as a player, that's where all the scouts are. And if you do well, that sets you up for the draft. And there's been so many great players come through the gate, through the Cape. Can you just tell us, Peter, man, like some are, who are some of the best 
players that you've seen come through the Cape Cod League, and why is that league so special to you? Well, for one thing, it's it's really the first pure taste of professional baseball for a young player because you're playing every day and you're playing with it's not just home. I mean, it's, there's not much travel, but at the same time, you're out on your own playing against guys from all around the country and the competition is tremendous. I mean, that summer was the summer of Darren Erstad. Yeah. And I lived very close to Falmouth where he played. And actually he was uh, rooming with a guy, a, a, a pitcher who um, his father was a very close friend of mine. And uh, I mean, Erstad, I, mean, I think he must have walked every old lady who lived in Falmouth across the street. <laughs> He's the most popular guy I've ever seen. He was a great player, but he, he has this work ethic. And he was famous for this. He worked at, there was a, there was a chain of small department stores. They had one in Falmouth and most guys like his friend and my friend, Brian Stevens, they go in the back and play you know, hockey and so forth. You had to have a job at that time on the Cape. And so you know, they would be in the back and they'd be fooling around. And first that one in June of 1994, he won a plaque from that, that chain for employee of the month. <laughs> Most <laughs> money for awesome. the cash register. Is, this is, this is that the, the fine direct yeah, that awesome. or what? I love that. And, it, you you know, it's Mark Kotze played in Bourne, which is I live in, in a section of Bourne. And um, so I stopped doing my, you know, for my wife, I stop at the grocery store and picking up some stuff. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm checking out. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye, there's some guy that's come and told this woman who was bagging the groceries, you know, I'll, I'll take care of it. So I pay and I go to get the groceries, reaches out the hand. Uh, I'm Mark Kotze. I pay for the board praise. Oh so my God. All the years when he was playing, when I go to spring training, he used to go in the, in the, in the players, you know, like little snack room and go get a bag of things and give us a, here, here are your groceries. <laughs> that's awesome. But now he's managing the team. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, it is funny. I, I worked at the, uh, you know, uh, back then you had to have a job. I think nowadays the guys stay at Airbnbs, you know, parents pay for it. when we played Peter, I think it was mandatory to have a job. I used to work at the stop and shop in the bakery department. It was like 11 women and me. And they're like, Hey, go in the freezer, make sure the bagels and the muffins are stacked. And I'm like, I couldn't wait to get to the freaking park. Cause I'm like, I got to get out of this freezer. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to freeze to death in the stop and shop in, in Brewster, Massachusetts. But it is true, man. What a, what a, what a cool place. You know, it's the essence of baseball. It's the essence of, of wood bats and the small towns. It's, you know, such a cool thing. And it, and it kind of, I want to rewind that a little bit, but it's, because for that, the family atmosphere that's in the Cape and what it, what that means to the true essence of baseball. Can you take us back to the beginning of Peter Gammons and your family and your sister and your mom and your dad? And like, what made you love baseball so much? What made you love music so much, you know, in your family? Well, the, the baseball, um, it was not an athletic family. My father was a musician, in fact, um, wow. and a teacher. But it, everyone, it was growing up in a small town in the middle of Massachusetts. I, I think that then baseball was so much a part of everyone's life. The red, it's uh, my, my dear friend Mike Barnacle once wrote, baseball is not a life and death matter, but the Red Sox are. We grew up about 10 <laughs> We, we grew up about 10 miles <laughs> apart from one another in the middle of Massachusetts. And that's just the way people grew up. It, it, it mattered all the time. And um, I loved it. I, I mean, I, forever throwing b balls against, you know, walls of well, my father taught at a prep school. So there are all sorts of like brick walls and everything. Be able to go out there with hard rubber balls. I had, I had uh, drawn strike zones all over right. all the buildings around Groton School uh, on the ch church. <laughs> there were like my old strike zones where yeah. I would go and throw all the time. Wow. Unfortunately, I blew my arm out by the time I was about 12 years old. <laughs> but uh, I, I loved, I mean, just playing at all times. We would go out, and from the time I was about eight or nine years old, um, we would go out, we'd split bats in half, and we use used tennis balls one-on-one, -on -one, and we would we would play. I would be one team, uh, White Sox, Red Sox, whoever. And you had to hit right-handed, left-handed, whatever the hitter was in the major league lineup. 
and you pitch and you you know you, you I, I I look back and I say well, one of the great things about baseball was civility because you didn't argue over I I I remember one time I had I was I was the White Sox one time and uh, I didn't have Ted Klosowski's muscles but I uh, <laughs> um, so so there was a ball and and uh, um, my friend hit this ball and he said that's gonna be a hit I said no I got Aparicio playing shortstop. <laughs> He's out. I mean, this is not Tom Button playing for the Red Sox. This is Aparicio. And we grew up we, because we played That's so awesome. many hours of those one-on-one -on -one games. Hey. We just learned, okay, you're right, it's Aparicio. <laughs> and it's just funny. I look back at that part of my life, and I said, that was a hugely important part of my childhood and learning how to, to, to get along with other people. I've always mm. credited that the, I, the concept of baseball as being that how important it was to my life. Oof. That makes a lot of sense. That's unbelievable. That's funny. It's, you take most guys talk about like, oh, just the swing, but you guys were taking it into the imaginary fielders. <laughs> that's yeah, next, yeah. that's I mean, next yeah. level. That's next level. I had, wiffle, I had Jim Landis in center field. It was <laughs> easy when I was the white side. That's so great. <laughs> that is so great. I remember those days too. Like, like, ah. Uh, I remember, matter of fact, it's funny. I had two guys come to the Cape, my buddy John Cunningham and my buddy Doug Buchan from college. And, and we used to play wiffle ball before I'd go to my games. And we would, you know, we'd be, the, you know, 86 Mechs versus 86 Red Sox or whatever. And we would, you know, you would yeah. bat the way the guys bat, right-handed, left-handed. And then like, it, I, I hope the, this generation of kids would can go, go back and be like, man, yeah. we'll start playing wiffle ball more. Go start emulating some of these guys in the game. Hit the way they hit, and like and like you said, you know, no Aparicio, he made that play <laughs> on, on yeah. the backhand. Yeah. He made that play. There's no no way it gets. And you know what else? Just, if... I, I I think the whole thing with wiffle ball and and playing those games is so important. I mean, it's. I remember when um, I was doing a story on Don Mattingly when he was he was still playing, um, and I make no bones, one of my favorite players of all people of all time, but. Um, so he took me to his, we went to his parents' house and he said, well, this is where I learned to hit. And so I'm, so it, it was set up because he had three older brothers and they played wiffle ball all the time. But the thing was that to be able to hit the ball over the roof, you had to hit the ball to left center. I mean, for a left-handed hitter. <laughs> right. You couldn't pull it because there was right. a tree there oh, and the wiffle ball would hit the tree. So Don Magley learned to hit Ugh. by Hitting the ball the other way because otherwise the ball wouldn't go over the house and he couldn't wow. beat his brothers. It would have been some big inning for the Rangers. They had four consecutive base hits, two doubles. Hey, did he get all of it? Did he? Holy cow, he did it! Holy cow, Mattingly is unbelievable. The opposite field. Holy cow. And the fans are giving him a standing ovation. Oh, isn't that great? Unbelievable! Wow, that's amazing. Genius! That's absolutely genius. <laughs> the, you know, uh, God, so great. So you you got your you know obviously that was a big part of your childhood growing up in a house Boston. Obviously, it was a it's a religion there. I, I'm so thankful I played for the Red Sox in 2008 because I got to see that religion. I got to see what that team means to anybody in the, in the you know in the New England area. Um, so for you, Peter. You end up your your professional career really starts with the Boston Globe, but at the beginning of you getting going there, something huge happens your first day. Can you take us back to that and what and, and what happened there? Well, I, I went there in um, as an intern and Bob Ryan, Hall of Fame basketball writer, one yeah. of the greats, yes. uh, and I started wow. the same day, and it was wow. it was right after Robert Kennedy been assassinated, which in Boston, of course was a big thing. And here I come from the University of North Carolina, although I'm a New Englander, and Bob came from Boston College. And so they threw us right into it. First day, um, they said, okay, uh, we need a, a, a front page story for the Afternoon Globe on what baseball is going to do to honor um, uh, Robert Kennedy. Wow. So, I mean, I had the Amer he, they gave me the American League and Bob the National League and um, the 330 stock, late stocks edition comes up, and there it is. Front page of the whole uh, paper. You know? uh, of course, G is before R, so I got the, the – the, my my name was on top of uh, Brian's. <laughs> <laughs> but, great. you know, it was, it was like, this is 
And we've, we've talked about and it's, that. That's a long, long time ago. Mm. Um, we knew right then, you know what? There's a thrill there. Mm. Um, it's competition to get things done. And I always loved deadlines in, in, uh, in the yeah. newspaper business because it was like playing athletics again. You had to go. I mean, we didn't have an elevator then at Fenway Park. So you got to walk down, talk to players, run back up, get it all in by one one fifteen in the morning or whatever. But it's there was a challenge and a thrill about writing. And I, you know, I always refer to myself as an ink stained wretch because <laughs> I started out as a writer. But I loved it. I mean, I started. Um, I was really lucky. I went back to school, and they call me during exams in January of um, uh, of uh, 1960, uh, 1969, and um, they uh, um, they said, "Can you start work next Monday?" Well, uh, well, could we? I mean, I'd love to, but you know, uh, I have some more exams, but. You know, I packed up and uh, I started on the, the 1st of February of 69. Wow. And, and and it used to be when with high school baseball. And I love covering the high, high schools or the colleges. But they used to, you know, you, you really wouldn't go out to the games that much. You you take the scores in the in, in the off. I, I, I couldn't do that. I mean, I had to go see. Mm. And so uh, Ryan used to always say that there was no such person as Jerry Remy. I invented him. <laughs> I went to see, he played for a tiny little high school way out of Boston. I went to see him. I fell in love with him as a player. As a matter of fact, we were close friends almost forever. Um, but uh, I mean, it was really fun. Billy Travers and guys that played in the big leagues. I saw that. I just ran into a guy who was Remy's roommate, uh, Bobby Aliana, who lives about six miles from me. That uh, he was on my first All Scholastic. Those are things. Yeah, it's a joyous profession. I mm-hmm. mean, I. When people are miserable, I go. Wait a minute, we're covering baseball. It's a, it's still really fun. Go to the ballpark. I mean, I've had I've had some some illness concerns in the last year, but when I'm in the ballpark, mm. it's it's completely whether it's, it's like going league. to church. It's like going to church sometimes, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I I was kidding the other day about every day that I saw Trevor Hoffman's son playing in the Cape was like it was the healthiest day uh. of my life. He was the most <laughs> energetic guy. In, yeah. Is an energetic guy in the world, and the days at the ballpark in September and October this last year, those series yeah. at Fenway, I mean, I just feel like this is completely normal. My life is mm. is normal. It's it's why we all move on. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I get to do what I love to do. I I went to a a, a really nice prep school, and we we our fiftieth um, reunion one time, and the one thing that people kept saying to me is. You know, you're different. You went and did what you wanted to do. Wow. And, so, and I said, probably it wasn't a choice. I was never right. going to end up on on Wall Street, but um, <laughs> I was not going to be. I was not going to be teaching Latin at Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that, Peter, because it, it, we weren't even going to go here, but it made me think about. I know you have such a love for scouts and the people who scout that scouted this game, and you really still to this day pump your fist going, we, the scouts need to be taken care of. They're the people. And when you just said before, like, I need to go, I need to watch the game. And this day and age we're living in now with the analytics and everything, it's like your eyes see things differently than the piece of paper that says this guy can't hit lefties and all that stuff. And you seem to have always been more on, like, the the same way players have been a little old school. You've kind of been, like, more of the old school writer with that stuff and, and kind of, you know how hard it is, right? Isn't there something to writing about there are writers who write about Sean Casey. He sucks. He can't hit lefties. But has that guy ever stepped in a box? I think you've always separated yourself from, oh, I'm going to destroy this guy, compared to you saying, this guy's doing something that not many humans can do, and I'm just going to kind of explain it that way. Is that how you your process kind of went when you I started I feel writing? very strongly about how hard it is. And I'll go back in 2004. No, 2012, I guess it was. must have been. They had the 100th anniversary of Fedway Park opening. And as they did in 2012, uh, in 1912, they played the Yankees. And the Red Sox invited, there must have been 250 players that once played for the Red One game, whatever. I was working for Nesson, too. And um, I don't blame them, but they were some ex-players. In, in, they did not... They did not go for this. Two hundred guys on the field. And I found I found a guy that 
Um, I, I apologize. I don't remember his name, but he, he pitched one game in his entire career. 1951 for the Red Sox, lost to the Yankees 62, 62, but he struck out Madeline DiMaggio back to back. So I said, That's like Moonlight I mean, Grand. You don't think something. this guy's a hero to his grandchildren? Oh, I mean, he struck out Madeline DiMaggio back yeah. to back. And so after the game, now there are a lot more guys that, you know, that are out there. And um, so there's a little complaining, um, to say the least. And uh, I said, you know, um, and, and Jim Rice was there. And I said, Jim, I mean, you were there with me in in the 70s and 80s when I would go every day on the road. I went out through some BP, shagged, wow. stuff like that. I misplayed, misjudged line drives you'd hit for taking early <laughs> BP. And uh, um, you have to understand, you're a great high school player, football, baseball, number one pick, Hall of Fame. But I don't think you played any harder in high school than I did. I just stunk. I mm. mean, it's as simple as that. I, I get that. But the thing is that from my standpoint, anybody who played one day in the major leagues is a great athlete because I know how hard it is out there shagging and doing that stuff. And when when you do that, um, I remember doing a lot of shagging with Dwight Evans, who was – one of the really great outfielders I ever spent. And it was so much fun working with him in the outfield and so forth. And, and uh, things he would, he would teach me about how he, he, he judged balls and, and so forth. But it's, you just go, this game is so hard and people don't appreciate it. Why it's real easy to go one for 22 or something. Yeah. It happens. It, it, it it happens that a guy gets out of whack as a pitcher and can't throw strikes for, for two starts in a row or a guy makes two errors in a game. And uh, I just – I have so much respect for that and how tough it is and the skills that go into it. And the next day after – I was on in, in the Yankee clubhouse, the post game where I was talking about that. The next day, a whole bunch of players, Yankee players, came out to the cage were lined up to thank me. And the number one, first person in line was Derek Jeter. Wow. And he said to me, you know, I mean, you're one of the first players I ever met. Buck Showalter and uh, Don Magley introduced me to you when I came up that, that year in September, in August and September of 95. And he said, and you've always respected me, but now I know you respect me even more. And I said, no, I mean, I know something about the game. I think I know something about the game. And I, it's a, it's a lot more fun when you respect it. I mean, right. it's and, and then just there were other guys, Mark Teixeira and guys who were big name players. They it, it told me once again one thing I really learned, and when I finally get done with my book, it'll be a lot in there about it. It's a game that creates insecurity, mm, and big, players are far more insecure than. I mean, there were Orioles who used to say. Boy, Cal Ripken is amazingly uh, insecure. Well, that drove him to become one of, I think, one of the twelve most important players in the history of the sport. Right. He was good to everybody. He worked at everything he did. He was a perfectionist. I mean, when we were at the Hall of Fame in September, and the day after the induction, every year I do a, I the forum asked me to do, a, I do a forum for the for the Hall, and it was um, Ted Simmons and Larry Walker and Derek Jeter and. Derek didn't like to talk a lot, but when you could get him alone and ask him basically one thing, he was always great. And one of those things was I used to, um, like one day I said to him, he was hitting alone at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Yankee Stadium. So I said, when you go in for what's a slump for you, one hit in four games, do you ever do anything differently in batting practice? He went, I've never done anything differently in batting practice since the day I first started in the uh, Gulf Coast League in 1992. And wow. it's and he talked at the hall and Simmons did too about routine and the importance of routine. And it's those players who are really have those really tight routines, Mike Trout. He uses the same I mean Gina uses the same bat, use it at the end that he used the day he imported to the Gulf Coast League. Trout changed his during the area code games in 2008, um, playing for the the, uh, the the Eastern team, 
uh, with Mike Kostrzewski in right field, Mike Trout in center field. <laughs> and uh, it's the same thing. And it's that r- routine and discipline. Not many of us have that in life. Yeah. And it, t- I admire that. I- I'm absolutely amazed by uh, Brad also was telling me about how Roger Clemens threw the same number of warm-up pitches every time before a start. Same amount out of the stretch, same amount out of the windup. Never, ne- never varied from that. Ugh. And I went, you know, now I understand why the first time he had the 20 strikeout game, what I thought was great was not the 20 strikeouts, but no walks next to the 20 strikeouts. Mm. That wow. ability to repeat and command, I mean, that's really tough yeah. in sports. And yeah. I, that's just something I, I, it, 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 I admire so much of those. Those great <sighs> disciplined players. Man, Can you this, take a, by the way, this is why Peter Gammons is the greatest. The, 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 just the names that just came out of your mouth and the stories you told about him and the, the, the things that went through your head yeah. to get you to your point. It's just, I'm so proud. Oh, it's a, it, it is, ama- it is amazing. It. it is amazing the stories that you have, Peter, in your head. <laughs> yeah. but I, I want to stay there with Clemens a little bit because I want to go back to that 86 team. And I know, obviously, it, you know, it didn't end the way that people in Boston didn't want it to end. But also, you know, they got it in 04. But I want to go back to that, you know, watching what happened there. Because I know for me, I played in the World Series in 2006, and I can remember being very nervous looking back at what happened with Bill Buckner. Because I thought, man, I just don't want to have one of those <clears throat> moments like, like that. And, and, you know, and I think that's some of the insecurity you talk about. You're in front of everybody. You're so vulnerable out there. It's such a hard game. It's such a tough sport. But I, but I, I want to look back at like Bill Buckner of how good of a player he was almost 3000 hits. When I look back, I'm saying this guy, it was a close to as close to a hall of famer as you can imagine. We're always going to remember that one play in game six. Can you take us back to that 86 team all the way through that, that the heartbreak of that world series and you know, just what it was like in Boston then. Well, the, the season was really, it did revolve around Clemens in a lot of ways because he, um, he came up as a rookie in ninety in 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 eighty four, eighty five. He got hurt and missed the last half of the season, and he comes back in in, in eighty six. And it's he has the great year, twenty four and four, twenty strikeout, no walk, and all the rest. And um, so they get to the they, they get to the World Series. The team was there were a lot of things that went right. I mean, they made some pickups during the season that really helped him. Spike Owen was a key guy coming on in, in uh, around late July when they made the trade for him. Um, it, it, But Buckner, they got him for Eckersley the year before. And I'm, I'm being a clubhouse, and clubhouse early. He'd have to have preparation on that ankle and foot for like an hour every, it was awful to, to what he went through. And, he was a really, really good hitter. I mean, and he couldn't run, but he was also a good first baseman. And he, there was a, he was, he was a really tough guy. And um, he was really, for me, he was a really fun player to be around because um, he was so good at so many things. He'd been through so many experiences and yet he played hurt every day. And that, that thing that happened, um, Dave Stapleton came in to play first base when they were ahead in most of the postseason games. But I understand why Buckner was out there in in some ways for John McNamara. I mean, and uh, but the thing on that play was that um, the ball gets Mookie Wilson tops it down the first baseline, but Bob Stanley had had fallen off and and. He wasn't going to be able to get to the bag. So Buckner was trying to run, scoop it, and dive for the bag, and that's how he missed it. Now, could Buckner have gotten it? No. Wookie Wilson was going to be safe no matter what. But Bill Buckner never gave in to anything. That was a joke about he and Bobby Valentine were the first and second draft choices of the of the, uh, of the the Dodgers in 68. They were both going to USC together, football players. Bobby was a great football player. Buck, Buckner was a great wide receiver out of Oregon. And um, they would race every day. The whole winter, never once did Buckner beat Valentine in a race. But 
Every day, Buckner said, I'll get you tomorrow. And he went back out and ran. And wow. to, it was funny, but it was that's who he was. And that play, you know, for him to be remembered as for making that error, there are a lot of things that happened in that game before yeah. that, that happened that got there. And um, it was really hard for him at times. I mean, he'd come back and people would mock him and so forth. And uh, the, the he, among the players... He had so much respect. And, Sean, you know this. The respect a player gets from his teammates is vital to what you, what we all think about who that player is. Yeah. Don't you agree? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's – I think as a player, when I look back now, you that's the one – that's the that's the staple, man, that I have the respect of my teammates going out there every day. Wait, speaking Absolutely. of respect – I mean, you played, you played with a guy – Jason Varitek, that somebody could get numbers and so forth and say, well, no, I've never met a player who didn't, didn't, uh, didn't think that didn't respect Jason Varitek about as much as anyone they ever played with. Yep. Oh, and you're right. Varitek was one of those guys. If he was hitting 210 or 280, you're like, there's our guy. You know, that, that, that's the guy right there that, you know, okay, we go as he goes, as he leads the team and leads that staff, you know, that's a, that's a great, you know, a great comp right there uh, of Veritech. Um, Peter, so as you're, as you're, you have so many things, you know, as you talk, I'm, as you talk, I'm blown away with the <laughs> names that, and the stories that you throw out yeah. there. It's like, I feel like a little kid, like I'm in like, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the clubhouse somewhere, like <laughs> this guy, that's how I feel sometimes in the trailer at MLB Network when you get going with some of your yeah. stories. I'm like, this is great. I don't even want to go do a show. Let's just have Peter talk for seven hours and we can listen to some of his stories. <laughs> You know, I want to go back to the 99 All-Star game because I was there. It was my first All-Star game. I mean, literally, Peter, I can't even tell you. I was like, I was 25 years old. It was my second year in the big leagues. I'm like, how did I get here? Like, I am blown. I am, My mind is blown. Fenway Park sold out. Pedro Martinez starting the game. All century teams there. You know, I have my video camera going. I have some of the greatest footage of my life in this video camera. And then we're out there and, you know, they introduce you and they just introduced the, you know, all center team. And then Ted Williams comes out. If it couldn't get any better, Ted Williams comes out in a golf cart and to throw out the first pitch. I got a couple questions on this. Can you take us back to that 99 all-star game and what it meant to you and what do you think it meant to the city of Boston and take us back to your relationship with Ted Williams and maybe a, a nugget here or there or a story that we could just, you know, sit back and say, man, that's really cool. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll tie it all together in, in two, two parts. 1986, I went to Sports Illustrated. So we decided to do the baseball issue on hitting. So I went, I, the idea was Box was coming off hitting, I think, 378 or 372. Yes. Manually knocked in 150 runs or something was the MVP, and so I did Boggs, Mattingly, and Ted for dinner to talk <laughs> hitting. And it was, we were in a room in a, in a place in Clearwater, Florida, uh, T.O. Pepe's, and uh, Pat Gillick had arranged so that the, the guy who owned it gave us this private room, and it was, it was tremendous. But so th at that time, Walter Riniak was the hitting coach for the Red Sox. And Boggs, a lot of guys, they talk about weight shifts. And, the, and Ted hated that stuff. It was, <laughs> it was, it was just, there was, there was always this, like, this difference between uh, Ted and, and, and Walter, which was fun. They're both so passionate. But <clears throat> they get into the argument about weight shifts. So Ted goes, oh, come on. I can't listen to the gammons. Get up. Show them how I hit. Now, I got to get up. I got a couple of glasses of wine. I got to get up and be Ted Williams hitting. So I get up there, but I do the first move with a little hit from my my left leg. Yeah. And a man says, stay there. And I'm, I'm trying to balance. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Ted, he's the only Ted goes, see, he knows how I hit. And Madigan goes, but the weight isn't even. That's a weight shift. And I said, can I sit down now? <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> so, so you got uh, Mattingly, Boggs, when... wait, Mattingly, Boggs, and Williams are all sitting there, and you're their dummy, and they're putting you in different positions. That's really what's I'm, happening. I'm Ted Williams. But you're... the <laughs> great part was when we were driving over, 
I drove 10 in bogs from Winter Haven, Florida to, to Clearwater. And magically, the Yankees were playing in Sarasota that day. They were still in, in Fort Lauderdale. So they, so anyway, so uh, he was going to meet us there. So I'm driving Ted and Boggs, and Ted, out of the blue, as he could do, says, uh, Boggs in the bat seat, and uh, he says, hey, uh, Wade, uh, ever smell the bat burn? And Wade goes, what? What are you, what are you talking about? And uh, he goes, yeah, you ever smell the bat burn? And he goes, uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. And Ted, well, ah, you're a slip piss hitter. You wouldn't, uh, no, you wouldn't, <laughs> you never hit the ball hard. So anyway, so we get to the dinner and um, so Ted asked the same question magically and he said, yeah, and he explains it. So I write it in the piece and it became like a phenomenon of like people had never heard of that, that, that you, you got a, you got a four seam fastball up in the zone. You get a swing perfectly foul it straight back. The, the, the seams would burn the bat. You get a little, you get a little burn. And um, so it, uh, it, it became like this, this thing. Um, and uh, uh, so when at 99, when he, he called Mark McGuire over because the year after McGuire, big home run year, and Dwight Evans was sitting. This is during this is during the event, were, right? This is during the All Star Game celebration year. All Star Game, here. and he was right, actually one seat in front of me over. So we were talking. So when he called McGuire over, Dwight said, "Well, I wonder what he's asking McGuire." He's, He's asking him, do you ever smell the bat burn? I'll give it to you. <laughs> and Dwight went, what? Yeah, so, um, and after the game, I went in and I, because uh, I wanted to, to, to prove to myself that he did. I went over to McGuire and he said, before I even got the question out, he said, you know what he asked me. I mean, and, uh, Mark Grace is next to wow. me and he said, what did he ask him? I said, did you ever smell the bat burn? And Gracie goes, um, I've never heard of that. Wow. And I said, it's lucky Ted isn't here with you. He can call you a piss hitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and so it, it, one of the greatest moments of my career, and this means, I can't tell you what this meant to me. Uh, 2016, um, seventh game in Cleveland, Cubs, Indians kind of cold, drizzly, and um, Chris Bryant calls, he's in the cage, and he comes out, and he said, uh, so when I fouled that, I can't remember who it was who was pitching for the Indians, but he fouled the ball back in the seventh inning, 3-2 pitch. Did, he, did you notice what I did? And I said, no, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I, I didn't. And he said, he said, well, I put the bat up to my nose because it was a perfect, it was a fastball up. I fouled it straight back, and I smelled the bat burn. And I wow. was hoping you, you saw it. Ah. And Oh, my God. And the next spring, I mean, I was I was trying to figure, oh, and next spring training, he said to me, Peter, that was like the, I mean, because his father, was, I actually saw his father play in the right. Red Sox farm system, and his family is from Boston originally. And, um, he said that was like the to me it was the greatest story I ever read. It was wow. like the and I I wanted to tell you, but I wanted to pick the right time. Wow! And which it really it still impacts me to this day. And um, I thought it was so cool that that he would that Chris would do that just because it's another guy who amazing. You know, what do we all have in common? We all love baseball. That's what it's all about. I mean, that's why sometimes. I guess people in management don't like it when I say, when it all comes down, it's all about the players. Yeah. That's not to say that who's right in labor. To go, that's the, you, you go to the park t to see players. Right. I mean, I don't know if you were still there at ESPN, Trinch, but I once, it, when we were watching all the games upstairs, <laughs> there was a tough play, a guy overran a base and, and – Bobby Valentine was saying, oh, I was so dumb. I, said, I was in. Oh, I was in the room. I was in the room. Keep going. Where? Yes. Where, it, 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 he. I mean. There tell was, the story. Go ahead. It was, it was hard to tell 
because it's just one sh- you couldn't see did somebody at third base make a mistake did something else happen i mean just to say it was a dumb it was a wrong base running play but we don't know what the fault was and bobby said peter your problem is you like players too much and it just was that one time when i said I spend two hundred and fifty dollars a night for my season tickets to Fenway Park, yeah. and I don't pay two hundred and fifty dollars to see a double switch because <laughs> it's all about the players. <laughs> I was in that room, but l- let me stop you right there, okay? Because, w- w- like, this is kind of full circle for you, and 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 I'll, I'll just get right to it. I'm going to say a name, and the name is John Walsh, right? For those who don't understand, a lot of young people who are watching right now, you would not have Tom Verducci. You would not have Ken Rosenthal. Uh, a, 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 any, name anybody that looks like me or Peter Jason who was Stark. on TV. Jason Stark. Jason Stark said it flat out. I wouldn't have my life without you. And I'll tell you right now, I said it early on. I would not be in this industry without Peter Gammons, without watching him on baseball tonight and saying, wait a minute, he couldn't hit he couldn't hit hundred. I couldn't hit hundred either, but I can stay in this game and I and I can be productive in this game and still be a part of this game and have an effect on it. And no nobody who hasn't picked up a ba- who hasn't picked up a baseball bat and stepped in a professional batter's box has had more influence on this game than you have, Peter, in my mind. And wow. so can you just tell us how when you went from the guy sitting there writing to all of a sudden you're sitting in a control room with somebody putting makeup on your face and an earpiece in your ear and probably me yelling in your ear, how the hell did you get there? And and how scared were you getting into that situation? It's, I mean, I'm really fortunate. I mean, John had picked me out um, in 88. Uh, I was um, writing for Sports Illustrated. And... Um, so I, it was more than part time, but I, because uh, I did a lot of, I did diamond notes once a week. I went to the All Star game, went to different things, but um, they hadn't, there hadn't been a guy to go from print to ESPN or, or on that. Will McDonough had done some in football, but no one had done the baseball, and um, I didn't think of it as being pressure, you know, like. Uh, Verducci like to, likes to kid me, and and Kenny Kenny Rosenthal has done some things that were that actually brought me to tears. Um, but as it turns out, great. If that's what, you know, if that's my contribution, that helped a lot of people get into the business. I mean, and Walsh was unbelievable. And I remember at first there were a lot of guys who were growing up. At t- I don't blame them for saying. What's a writer, writer, you know, free lunch guy doing here? <laughs> right. in the, oh, and by the way, TV. For, for people at home, John Walsh was an ESPN legend. I mean, basically created Sports yes. Center and all that. Sorry, keep going. A ge- and a genius. He was actually Brilliant. editor of Rolling Stone for a while, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, it, but he, it, look, uh, him, look him up. He, I remember him saying to me, as we were, I, we had with two years to plot out what is baseball tonight going to be. I mean, I, that's, a, that's a great thrill to think that I was part of what that the show was going to be like. And, and, um, but it was always, he'd say to me, look, it, I don't care. People give me the future of television is, it, is information. It's not about talking heads. It's about information. You're the beginning here of information here. And that's, that's where it starts. And he was great to me in every way, but there were a lot of people who are great. I mean, there were so many great Got, uh, editors and, and uh, uh, different guys that I went out on the road with that uh, helped me out. And the thing that, that John really understood is that, and um, I'm lucky uh, in, this, in this way, in many ways, but he let me basically decide the next couple of guys. So um, if it looks like it's all inbred with Gammons, Kirchin, <laughs> and Stark. Yeah. Those are the those are the first two guys that are my two. <laughs> uh, you picked two. Uh, I mean, you but, couldn't you pick know, two better I mean, people either. Two but, better human beings. But, but we all had it in our blood. I mean, that's we had baseball in our blood, and uh, to this day, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I I broke down when Timmy got, got you know it, now that he's going to be there. In uh, this time, it was tremendous for me with Jason. Uh, I think I said it in my speech in Cooperstown that. 
I talked to Jason more in 20 something years than I talked to my wife. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Timmy and, and, and people like Kenny that I know, Rosenthal and, and, uh, and Verducci for the beginning was to me, oh, wow. I mean, this guy is really, really good. And um, it, it was, a, it, nobody should be thankful. Everyone should be thankful for John Walsh, but also the fun that he created and what he did for um, all of us insane wretches is, is, is really important. I mean, what he did for the, the media in, in general and elevated, I think he elevated, it didn't lower sports writing by people going into television. It elevated. Them. And you look right. now at, at, at the collection at the athletic or all the Tom has done at sports illustrated and the rest. It, it's, uh, it was a great experience, and I'm I'm really proud of it of uh, being in those days with, uh, um, and you know, in '88 and '89. I mean, talk about being lucky. I each year, John gave me a partner that would come when I did when I did diamond notes or when I did things or we did the All Star game, we did the playoffs or World Series. Yeah, like your field producer guy. Yeah, right. '88, Jim Cott. '89, Joe Torrey. Those are my <laughs> first two partners in the business. Holy cow. Oh, my That's a good God. Start. Well, we're lucky is, to have you. You're a godfather to everybody in this oh industry. Oh, my so. gosh. Well, you know, it's so great, too, Peter, for for us, like the diamond notes, the all the things that baseball tonight was as a kid. I'm like, this is unbelievable. And that's why, like I said, with the Cape, when we got to see you, we're like, man, this guy's a superstar for us. But I think ESPN and, you know, baseball tonight really brought that out. And, you know, I think about some of the games that you've been a part of, some of the greatest games ever. I go back to that 2000, the Aaron Boone game, 2003, game seven. Booney, I had just, I had just played with Booney for six years. One of my best friends in the game, you know, he got traded from the Reds to the Yankees. And, you know, I think we all look back at that, that game, um, you know, with uh, in game seven as a fan. Can you take us back to that game and just the impact of Boone, but just all of it? It was so... Those two teams were so good for two years. And what's really fascinating to me about it, and I, I think Theo and Jed, everybody would agree, the 93 Red Sox were better than – I mean, the 2003 Red Sox were better than the 2003 uh, Yankees, and the 2004 Yankees were better than the 2004 Red Sox. Mm, wow. But just they were so close, and it was so emotional. And in that game, with Pedro up 5-2, to two and, and it just, you know, there, was, there was so much drama in there – and then, you know, they, they come back and the, the, the Yankees tie it up. Um, there was so much tension, so much heck, upstairs, the controversy over Pedro being out of the game. Now Pedro, Pedro's in the game again. And um, and then for it to be, I mean, Aaron went in as a pinch runner in the eighth, <laughs> right. eighth, eighth inning of that game. I mean, and uh, it was it was amazing. Now, in 1986, going back to 86, Aaron was, I don't know how old he was, but they used to do live shots out of Anaheim Stadium. And it, it was a great guy that would come down from KTLA in, in Los Angeles. Aaron did the live shots one afternoon before Red Sox Angel. He <laughs> interviewed me what? before what? a game. I mean, it was hilarious. So, I mean, <laughs> he was good at television when he was like eight or yeah. nine years old. I'll never forget him asking Tim DeSensis a question. Why did your father make that error last night? <laughs> <laughs> but, but he, uh, and then for him, I mean, his father uh, had been a longtime scout for the Red Sox. I mean, I know the generations of the Boone family. And the emotion of being out there, uh, we had a, uh, uh, my producer was a guy named Charlie Moynihan. Um, and we had built up pretty good relationships with the guys like on the ground crew and everything in New York. You know, it's just be polite to people. It's amazing what they, how, yep. how they're polite to you. And um, so they let us sort of out so that when Boone hit the home run, we were not trapped in some room up in, uh, in the bowels of Yankee stadium. We were already on, on our way down there. And I remember, you know, looking out, and I looked at this Tim Wakefield down on one knee on the mound, just breaking my heart because he he went through a lot in his time in Boston. Once got 
taken off the postseason roster in, in it was an incredible injustice. And then, but you know, Aaron Boone, one of one of my favorite players too. Uh, ground ball, nineteen ninety three, uh, last out of the uh, Cape Cod League playoffs. <laughs> ground ball to Aaron Boone, by the way. Right? <laughs> Uh, in, in Orleans, same field. Wow. Um, but anyway, so uh, <laughs> and I remember walking. I look at Charlie and said, "You know what? I mean, how how lucky are we? <laughs> We're being paid to cover maybe the greatest game ever played in the greatest sporting event in a venue in North America, and we're walking down here, and it's it's unbelievable. I mean, it was deafening. It was." Yeah. I mean, that was an unforgettable night. And I, people say, well, you're from Boston. No, no, it was an unforgettable night because they're all people. It doesn't, Aaron, Aaron almost got traded to the Red Sox. Right. That, that season during the trade deadline. So, I mean, that's, it, it, it's one of those things that happened. But he was, he was actually, um, if he hadn't ended up in the playoffs, he was going to be doing television at ESPN <laughs> through the playoffs. Right. Oh, was he? Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. So, but it, and then the next year, when all it went on, I mean, it, it's um, people who don't think personality has something to do with it. I mean, when you get down to that time, and I people go, you're out of your mind when you say this, uh, but the players who were there know it's true. That 2014 was insane, the Red Sox, but <laughs> it was part of what made them great. And but I've said if if Kevin Millar wasn't on that team, the Red Sox don't come down from three and out, three and out. Mm. And I don't care what anybody thinks of him as a player. I mean, he was a good major league player, but he that day before game four, and I'm out there about two o'clock, and he comes up the steps, sort of looking around at the weather, and he goes, Petey. The Yankees don't win tonight. They're done. Oh, and, my you know, God. I, I, I start laughing. And, you know, there are a few other words thrown in there in the middle <laughs> of the, yeah. for the kids. But, I mean, it was like and that was his theme the whole day. And it was that there was something about that we have nothing to lose. They have everything to lose that the Red Sox injected into that series. Yeah. And they had the right and, manager for it, too, right? For that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, players that. I mean, Johnny Damon was a really, really good player, totally fearless. I don't know how he ever survived all the crashes of the walls and everything that he did. <laughs> hey, Peter, uh, is, he, is he a Hall of Famer, Damon? I mean, not quite, but boy, he's, he's a lot he's closer close. than people think. Yes, he's you know, a lot in, closer. in voting for it, it's amazing. At first, you go, oh, he's not a Hall of Famer. And the more you study it, the more you go, you know what? Uh, I haven't given this guy the, the right to. Uh, I mean, the first two times Jeff Kent was on the ballot, I didn't vote for him. And I voted for him every time since because, wait a minute, this guy was a really, he was really tough. Yeah. Um, clutch and clutch too. He should yes. be, he, he should be in Cooperstown, Peter. Jeff oh, Kent absolutely. should be in Cooperstown. And and it's, um, I don't know, that, that, they just had the right group of, of people and players. I mean, in the, in July when, uh, when Bronson Royal hit, uh, a Rod right. and then Varitek punched. Well, you know, the, no, you know, I remember years later, Alex saying to me, "I never understood." You know, he, I mean, he hit me a couple of times. I said, "Alex, when you were playing in the state playoffs in Florida, when you guys were in high school, he drilled you twice because he didn't like the way you acted out of the field." Bronson <laughs> actually hit, hit uh, A Rod twice oh in my, high school. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's great. And A Rod didn't even know, right? <laughs> No, you know, I just, you know, they're both great. It just it was so funny how those things go in baseball. But you know, there's a time and place, and nobody got hurt. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And and that that championship for Boston, obviously, people, you know, Millar talks about it. All those guys talk about how you know it meant so much to everybody. Even the grave, the graveyards in, in Boston, people were bringing flowers and yeah. Budweisers or whatever to the to the grave sites to. You know, to remember that 2014, and uh, uh, was 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 Pedro one of the was Pedro the best pitcher ever, or is he in the conversation on Mount Everest? I mean, not, not Mount Everest, Mount Rushmore. Mount Everest. Mount Everest. <laughs> I mean, I I never saw Koufax live. Um, Koufax, Pedro. 
I mean, Walter Johnson in his time, but he's one of the greatest. And, and what he brought to the ballpark, the electricity, I mean, I I got to know him when he was in Montreal, and uh, there was just always something totally different about him. And the, the shame of it is when he came over to the Red Sox, all of a sudden you had a whole different audience in the ballpark. And then tickets got so expensive, a lot of the people that would come just to see Pedro couldn't afford it anymore, which is wow. too bad. But he is a he's a lifetime hero in Boston. And and uh, I mean he 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 lives outside of Boston now and and uh, is a major part of the community and it should be. I mean he was it was the the right guy and it was a certain people just had this this duende or whatever, you know, it, that is, it makes them special. And Pedro really had it. I, I, I was once asked about going through um, Louis Tian, Pedro Martinez, Kurt Schilling, Roger Clemens, all of whom in my 50 years of covering Major League Baseball and, and living in Boston, I covered in very different personalities. Um, I'm not sure t- for one game I wouldn't pick Tion, um, oh, but wow. it was just different. I mean, but they're all very different, and and and, and each guy's. I mean, Shuley was a great money pitcher, um, incredible. I mean, you consider three World Series in seven years, one throwing a 99 miles an hour, and the next one throwing 94, 95, and the last one throwing 85 to <laughs> to 90, and, and he won three. He won in each series each one of those world championship years. And, um, and Roger was absolutely great. And uh, it's, again, I'm really lucky for someone who loves baseball, who spent, even though I'm right-handed, but I spent a lot of hours throwing against the wall, particular place, because my idol at when I was, I'd say 10 years old was Herb Score. I love Herb Scores. Delivery, the way he tucked the glove underneath the arm. I used to try to do that against walls for hours. And, again, I mean, obviously, I didn't throw hard like he did, and obviously uh, I was right-handed. But uh, I was listening on my transistor radio to the Yankee-Indian game the night that McDougal's line drive hit score. And I got to know him really well when he was a broadcaster. And, and, um, like, he used to bring my life back into the circle, you know, just – Ah, you know, I have a ten-year-old kid worshiping this guy, and mm-hmm. you know, now I get to go sit in, the, in in this radio booth with him and and talk baseball with him. Yeah, well, it, you know, what's amazing, what's amazing, Peter, is that you know you talk about that full circle. You're a ten-year-old kid. You're trying to be Herb Score. You're with your family. You have so many, you know, so many things that, that that your family loves. You're in the Boston. You start with the Boston Globe, SI. You know all the things. Baseball tonight. You revolutionized TV. You know it, it's amazing. Oh three, oh four, and then and then here we are. Oh five. You get the call that Peter Gammons is g- going to Cooperstown. What did that mean to you? And what was that? Can you take us back to the call? Um, and, and what was that like? Um, I was out in Anaheim, uh, at the winter meetings and, um, there was a call left on my phone, uh, but it wasn't cell phones. It was left on the phone in my room. I went out working out and came back and, and, you know, I mean, obviously I was really excited. Um, and I was doing, I did sports centers, uh, at the time they were releasing it, which was, which was great. And there were some people who were terrific. I mean, sending me messages and and so forth that really uh, impacted me. Um, Junior Griffey for one of them. Um, But um, it meant a great deal. That day, though, I'm lucky because the, the writers, the writer and the broadcaster then were in the, the full, the same ceremony that the players, it was Ryan Sandberg and Wade Boggs. Wow. Um, Full circle. And, uh, wow. Yeah. And um, so you, you go and you go and I'm, I'm sitting and I had behind me, I was really nervous. And um, I was going third in the speaker. Jerry Coleman was first, and then uh, Ryan Sandberg, and then I was next and Wade Boggs. So now 
I'm saying, but I had um, Kirby Puckett and George Brett sitting right behind me. Huh. And which I owe them a, a lot of a thanks because they're, they're constantly one or the other would lean over and go, Hey, Petey, just remember the only thing anybody's going to remember is what you screw up. You know, they're going to be laughing so hard. And then there was, the question was Manny Ramirez going to be traded that weekend. There was talk about the Mets, a right. five for one deal. So it was in the Blackberry era. And so Ryan Sandberg is just about done with his speech. And now I know, okay, it's coming. So I look at my BlackBerry has a message and it's from Theo. We're not trading Manny Ramirez. It's all the talks are off. So I get up to go, go to the uh, podium to speak. And a couple of guys, you know, leather lung guys from New England. Hey, Peters, Manny going to get traded. And I go, <laughs> I can report at this time that uh, I held the BlackBerry up. Manny Ramirez is not being traded. So I thought the appropriate way to start my speech was to report on that something. That is awesome. And, uh, but it was, it was the, looking out at all those people and just thinking, you know, I mean, uh, it's such a thrill. I, I remember one time in 1989 covering the Hall of Fame. Uh, it was smaller. It wasn't the big, huge area. But Chris Berman and I were doing it together. And um, it was uh, – Chris loved it because all of a sudden he got people coming up and asking me to sign $20 bills because they, they thought I looked like the face of the $20 bills. And Berman was, it was hysterical. <laughs> you do. It was Peter, really you do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> but, it was, but it was also Yaz and Johnny Bench. I mean, that was, wow. I mean, I covered, yeah, Yaz helped me when I was in 1972. I mean, he gave me advice about, Eddie Casco was a manager. We've been playing tennis. He said to Yaz, what advice would you give a rookie reporter? He said, Peter, let me tell you, you have to be critical at times. It's, it's going to be your job. But he said, my advice to you, and never forget it, be critical, write what you, you think you have to write, but always be there the next day. Mm. And that was the lesson. Uh, and I just, I think about it. And then, you know, I've, I've done a lot with Yaz in the last few years and, and had some pretty emotional moments when I, when I took his grandson and him out to the left field wall at Fenway right. Park for the first time together. And I asked, Carl, what does this mean? And his answer was, Peter, Next to 67, this is the greatest moment of my baseball life. And Mike and that Mike uh, the, still wow. kids me. How in the world didn't you start crying? I said, <laughs> believe me, when I finally stopped this thing, I went right over to the corner of the dugout and uh, uh, broke down. It was, it was just, oh my god! I mean, been there with the ass with so many moments and mm. and, uh, and and all and it that was that's one that's pretty close to my best moment. I think in uh, 50 years of covering, walking out with those things, I, I knew Mike pretty well from the Cape Cod League. Wow. And um, it's, you know, Carl's Carl, and he just, he, his presence in New England, because the Red Sox were, were nothing for a lot of years until, yeah, until 67. So that, in some ways, there's more of the audience today that, that understands he has and understands Ted. Mm. And uh, um, so that moment was, that's one of my favorites. And I'll tell you, they, I got asked to do a thing recently. Greatest postseason game you ever saw. Ooh, we were going to ask and you that. This so we'll give you a couple of days. Um, and uh, I said, no, nah, I don't need uh, I mean, greatest pitching performance. No question. 2000, Roger Clemens, game four, Seattle, one hitter, uh, shutout. And that was and, a, that was a big team with A-Rod and those guys. That was a crazy lineup he faced. He now. threw an A-Rod in the first inning. Mm -hmm. knocked him down twice. <laughs> and it was, I mean, I, going back, I, I had the, I went back, they gave me the, I got the broadcast so I could watch the whole game um, again. And I got to tell you, Bob Costas and Joe Morgan on that game, they were 
thank goodness I didn't do play by play because I, <laughs> I I would I would just look back and say no shit they were so great they had everything right in that game mm-hmm. and uh, but it was so much fun seeing it again because there was so much emotion um, you know my my now working for the Red Sox Paul Abbott was a, starting for Seattle and the players that were in that game and everything with the Yankees and 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 it was. Cummins was unbelievable. I mean, the the one hit went off Tino Martinez's glove. I mean, it was he was so good, a one hitter. And at the time, in games that he started in the postseason, only for the Yankees and Red Sox, of course, at that time in his career, the teams he pitched for were four and ten. Mm. He had lost the first two games in the ALDS. And there was a whole – Roger Clemens can't pitch a big game. And he went out there to prove to the world that – and that was like his – to me, it was like the beginning of the run to, to 355 was was that game was the proof of who Roger Clemens was. And, you know, it's it's – we all have talked about how strange it could be that after – um, the 25th of January, that three of the greatest players uh, that I've ever seen, Roger Clemens, Barry Bonds, and Alex Rodriguez, are not going to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that anymore. I'm just going to say, you know what? I could pay to, to cover those guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I agree. I, and I play, <clears throat> playing against those guys – my feeling is they should all be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, they should all be in the Hall of Fame. That's just that's my opinion. In my in my opinion, playing against those guys, and that's that's the bottom line. Um, who? I, that's a great question because this is kind of one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Now, obviously, they still have the vote, and they're still on the ballot. Who's not on the ballot? Are there, are there a few guys that aren't in Cooperstown that you feel like should be? Um, well, my campaign, my 20 year campaign for Ted Simmons is over. So (laughs) that makes me a very happy man. That's great. Uh, Yes. But, um, I have to go back and really think about it. I mean, it's, um, and and fortunately, Alan Trammell finally made it in there because that, that was one I really felt very strongly about um dale murphy i think dale murphy is one i think dwight evans is one dwight I mean, evans if, yes if what you about look, donnie what about donnie he goes into there too right or i you know the, the, the don manley when he was in high school had days when he couldn't go to school because of that back mm. and that's what shortened his career he's a hall of fame player he's a hall of fame person um he had a back issue and um i always think of him as a hall of famer yeah, and um, he is. You know, it, he, he's. There's. I, I agree. There's no question in my mind about that. And then Evans had been beaned, had three concussions, and uh, on the day that, as Yastrzemski said, Peter, he found balance. July third, um, nineteen eighty. Um, when he went from hitting 179 to being one of the five best players in baseball in the yeah. de- next decade, I had to shag for an hour and a half at 100 degree temperatures in, in Baltimore <laughs> watching that. Evans learn how to get, to get back. But he was a great player. There have been, you know, I, I know what Dusty Baker would probably say to me you, you make, a, make an argument for your buddy Reggie Smith, too. Wow, really? Reggie Smith? He always said to me, and, and you know, I obviously am a, a dusty file all the way. Um, he's always said to me, next to Henry Aaron, Reggie Smith was the greatest teammate he ever had. Wow. wow. And if you're if you're Dusty Baker's second best teammate, you're pretty special. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You're doing something right. What about, what about Dick Allen? Oh, Dick Allen for sure, too. I mean, I had so much fun with uh, with the family. I mean, I've written a lot about it, and um, it's uh, – they were such characters. And, I mean, Hank Allen actually played pro basketball uh, and wow. was a good major league player. And, of course, 
um, there's a certain uh, third baseman in Houston, um, one of my favorites, whose grandfather um, not only was the president of the Washington uh, Senators when Ted Williams was the manager and Hank Allen was playing for him, but he did the he did all the books for their their stables. Bregman? And the Allen Is brothers became the first African Americans ever to have a horse in the Kentucky Derby. Wow. Really? That's Bre Bregman. Is that Bre that's Alex Bregman? Bregman. His grandfather was a man. He was Hubert oh Humphrey's my. campaign manager for a while. Oh my gosh. Uh, the Bregman family. That's where the confidence you know, comes from, I guess. <laughs> I uh, the Bregmans are an amazing family story from the great grandfather uh, getting out of Russia when they were trying to persecute all Jews to what they've done all these generations. It's I mean, I have a very strong feeling about everything to do with the Bregman family and what they've done in, for wow. people in this wow. country. It's, a, it's an wow. amazing story. And the, the relationship about Hank Allen, his godfather. Wow. Bregman's grandfather. I, it's, it's an amazing uh, story of how many people are, are tied together <laughs> in those two families. But the Allens, Dick Allen was, I mean, I remember being... 1972, my first year being at Dick Allen Mug Night in Chicago. <laughs> that was his first year with the White Sox when he was MVP. And he hit this unbelievable home run off Sonny Siebert to center field. And my regret is one time when I moved, I lost my Hank Allen mug that I wanted to keep forever. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Oh, it's so great. That's so great. Um, So, Peter, for you, for you as – you know, after Cooperstown and, you know, obviously things happen in life, scary things, you know, ups, ups and downs. You had a pretty scary, you know, life-threatening aneurysm. I believe it was in 2006. Yes. Can, can you can you talk us, uh, tell us about that? And obviously you're doing wonderful today, you know, all these years later. But I know for all of us that are your friends, that was a very scary time for us and for you. Can you take us back to that time? I was just driving from here to uh, a gym in, in uh, Mashpee about 50, about 10 miles away. And I had this headache. I had been on, I just gotten back in the night before from Chicago from doing the ESPN game. And I got this really bad headache. And it was almost like being, you know, I couldn't really see very well. So I pulled over. I was going to take a nap and then go to the gym. And uh, a woman, um, saw me getting in the back of my car, lying down in the back seat. She was at an ATM right next to it. And uh, turns out she was a nurse. No. She was a retired nurse from Mass General Hospital. And that and I had called home. And, and uh, so they got the, uh, the Mashby Rescue got me. And they got me over to Falmouth Hospital. And they had, the nurse thought it was a heart attack. They tested me for, and knew it wasn't. So when I got to the hospital, they immediately took me into the in, into the um, in the emergency room to test me for an aneurysm, and it was. I got flown in, had the operation, and uh, it was a while. Um, I had an amazing doctor, um, and I had a lot of friends. And speaking of Don Mattingly, about one of the first times I could really be awake and, and look at me, my wife had brought me mail, and I got a, I got a. Uh, uh, an envelope from FedEx and it was a, you know, it was a thin, and I had no idea. You know, I look at it and said, Evansville, Indiana. I said, I only know one person from Evansville, Indiana in my life. So I opened it up and Don Mattingly had sent me this and his wife had given oh. him when he was 17 years old, sent it to me. And, oh my uh, gosh. So if that doesn't tell you who Don Mattingly is, uh, that's wow. who he is. Wow. Oh my gosh. What an, Unbelievable story! Wow, and uh, it's it's been around my neck ever, forever since. It's beautiful. Oh. That's a long time. Fifth, sixteen years. Sixteen and years. It's, uh, it's always there. Unbelievable. Uh, Amazing. Thank God. It, yeah, yeah. Thank God is right. Thank God for you. I'm so <laughs> well, it's you know, it's and you know, it was the doctor. It was. It was not once I started. Even when I got the rehab, I I didn't have to relearn anything. Doctor had done such a clean job. 
because they told me oh, it'll be two and a half years before you can work. And you remember, Jim, I was back on the, I was doing live shots for Fenway Park at two and a half months. Yeah, I'll take it another <laughs> step further. If you're ever at a, a professional baseball event and Peter Gammon is there, you better, there's going to be one less place in the gym for you to hang out because this guy will be up there at 530 in the morning after the aneurysm. <laughs> running like nine miles on a treadmill. So every time I've ever seen you in a gym, I've been like, that's so awesome that he got through that aneurysm thing. So oh my amazing. God, it's so great. That's unbelievable, man. Well, P Peter, also too, brother, your, your love for music. I know a few years ago we were at the uh, the Hot Stove event, player to be named later, the foundation that you, Theo, and Paul Epstein have together. Um, and I, you know, you know, Ed Vetter, our buddy Ed Vetter's out there ripping in, you know, and there's Peter, you know, ripping with them. And, and I know you had talked about Jackson Brown, you know, being close to them. You've played with Buffalo Tom, um, you know, um, so many things. And I know music is a huge part of, you know, you can, who has, for anyone who hasn't seen Peter games play guitar, this guy could legitimately <laughs> yep. rip the guitar. It's unbelievable. He's a songwriter. And can you just talk about how, You've kind of parlayed your, you know, your baseball status, uh, you know, people knowing you through that to getting to, you know, rub elbows with some of the greatest art musicians that we've ever seen. Uh, it, I, it's in 2000, some friends of mine came to me and said, why don't you do a, you know, I wouldn't do a golf tournament. I'm, I'm not a golfer and. So I said, they said, what kind of thing would you like to do to raise money for the Jimmy Fund and some things? Well, why don't we do a rock and roll concert? And uh, no, I, do, I didn't play then. And, and uh, I had played when I was a kid. And uh, um, so that's how we started it. And um, then in uh, a couple of musicians said, hey, come on, you know, come back and play. Do a couple of songs each time. And so I started up with that. And then... In 2004, Theo came to me and said, look, I mean, can we tie together Hot Stove Cool Music and the foundation to be named later? I said, great. I mean, that's and Theo's brother, Paul, was just a tremendous person. And so we, we put it all together. And, you know, we've been fortunate to, to raise m many millions for different things in the city. I'm wearing my... My base shirt. We uh, um, we we have, now have a base in Chicago as well as for kids, not only sports but it's the education. Matter of fact, we had a kid that came out of the base. We had a, a celebration of our Gammon Scholars last night, and it was a kid that, that went from from Cuba came to um, came to the United States, went to the base because he could play baseball with other kids in the inner city. Then the education. He's now a dentist and he's pre med. And today he's leaving for for Nigeria to spend half a year in Nigeria studying medicine in Nigeria. I'm thinking, this is what this is what we really want, you know. And, and we've been really, for Theo and Paul have done a great job. The foundation's done well. I don't know how they pick Gammon scholars because if you look at my academic history, <laughs> get, the, word, the name Gammons and scholars never went. <laughs> Oh, but it's great. it's it was it's great fun and it's it's meant a lot to us. The uh, kids, there was one kid last year. The Cardinals took in the second round, got a couple million dollars, and and uh, had had moved here from the Dominican in the seventh grade. And he's brilliant. He was number one in his class at a prep school that John Kennedy went to. So it, it wasn't like it, it wasn't wow. a dumb place. <laughs> but it's it's it, it's the purpose in, in just being able to open it up and have this fun with the music and be able to, to, to do a lot with people. I mean, the we, Theo's done a great job opening it in Chicago and in Boston, it's been really successful. And actually our first concert back after two years um, is April 30th. And Sean Casey might hear from me about coming in and uh, oh. helping out be, be one of the, uh, one of the guys uh, doing, because the Red Sox were on the road that day, but let me know. Been, I'll be there, Peter. I'll be there. Let me know what it is. Oh, wow. But it's amazing. You know, the musicians are so, there's so much Derek Trucks, who was actually a great uncle. Was oh. like, Ted Williams said he was the hardest throwing pitcher he ever faced. So, oh, I, dude. I've never finished that. I've got to finish that song, but uh, <laughs> I'm writing it so that, so that I can go down to Derek's place in, uh, 
in in uh, Jacksonville, and uh, he can record it. Oh, Derek, Derek Trucks! I met Derek Trucks at the 2016 uh, uh, World Series with Cubs Red Sox, and you know we were sitting in the in the box, and you know a guy had some long hair, nice guy. I'd been talking to him for two days, Peter. Then um, Rob Capilli, who's you know uh, part of Major League Baseball, says, "Hey, do you know who that is?" I was like, "No, but great dude." They're like, no, it's Derek Trucks. He's like, he might be the greatest slide guitar player. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, he is the greatest slide guitar player ever. And he's with the Almond Brothers when he was like eleven, and and you know, unbelievable oh, yeah. story. And I went and saw them, Peter. They came to Pittsburgh, and Derek left me some tickets for the Tedeschi Trucks band. Him and Susan mm-hmm. Tedeschi. Oh, I mean. When he plays guitar, and I know you could appreciate this for a guy that can play guitar, I've tried to play it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn, but it's so hard to learn. When you watch him make that thing talk, it is one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen when you watch Derek Trucks play, play guitar. It's a couple of times when he's come in for our, our, our fundraisers, he, uh, we've played along with Susan and, and Derek. And uh, it's been one of those. Um, he's so overwhelming in in and brilliant that I mean he never shows off. He just he plays very uh, very modest, <laughs> yeah. uh, an incredibly good human being. And uh, but he, you know, he, he is a conductor. Without you, don't even look at him. His music alone conducts. It's it's like he's a symphony orchestra conductor, and. Uh, uh, I remember one time he was, oh, who was he with? I was, they, the Tedeschi Trucks band opened for somebody. And I remember a couple of the guys said before, from the other band said, it's not fair. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, we're good, but no, it's not fair having him open up. That's Let amazing. it be the, the closing act around here. <laughs> what do you and guys think? When, I was going to say, what do you guys think? Like, there's some sort of poetry. Sorry, my dog's barking upstairs. There's a poetry between music and baseball that's different you know like you go to a basketball game in an arena and it's like you know that's cranking hard music but there's some sort of connection between musicians and baseball and baseball players and musicians and just some sort of symbiosis between the two things that's different than any other sport with music don't you guys agree with that it's it's strange well now for six or seven years when we do our concerts Having Bernie Williams as the lead guitarist, so is, that is an out of body experience. I mean, he is so good. <laughs> so besides good. just being, I mean, when he goes over to like to the bass and the place in the ears, it's unbelievable how he is with the kids and, and, and he's just. But 2019, we do a concert in Boston. We do a concert in Chicago. 2019, we had Buddy Guy for like six songs, which was. Um, one of my greatest idols. Uh, and so Bernie and I got to play with Buddy Guy. Wow. And uh, so we get done, and it, it's, it, it, is, it is amazing being there with him. I mean, he's just he's so phenomenal and it's so, so overpowering. But so it gets done. And, um, you know, we've, we've, we're playing as he goes off the stage and so forth. And Bernie walked across the stage and gave me a little hug and said, Peter, this is like, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. This guy's won four World Series rings. <laughs> he's got three, three uh, two batting titles. He's won about four gold gloves. Um, and in the moment, it, I'm sure you back up and, you know, 20 years from now, he wouldn't say, but in the moment, because of and plus he's he's played in so many huge situations and and been a great money player that in that moment that was the greatest thing yeah because it was buddy guy that was because we <laughs> each were down it went down to his dressing room and you know it, it, he gave me a shot of wild turkey before <laughs> I went up and, oh, <laughs> that's a secret sauce <laughs> the 20th, uh, 2004 Red Sox went up that. Yeah, right, exactly. Right, they were right. doing that before the games. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, um, Peter, what about playing with with our friend Ed Better? I mean, just you know, such a wonderful guy. Loves obviously loves his great relationship with Theo, with you. You know, um, you know, he when we were there, I think a few years ago in Boston when he was playing that event, and you were up there playing with him, and 
Theo was too. And Theo stumbled off the amp. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? You know, he's on the amp ripping. <laughs> bam, the amp falls. I'm like, oh, there goes the, there goes the uh, president of the Cubs at the time. But can you talk about your relationship with Ed and, and, and you know, his relationship with baseball and, 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 and you guys? Well, he definitely legitimately loves the game. And, yeah. but, and he, and he loved the Cubs. And so, but the most overpowering thing about Eddie Vedder to me is he just loves people. Yeah. And I mean, he once asked me, how come, uh, I mean, he said, you know, favorite songs that you have. And um, I said, my favorite Pearl Jam song will always be a wish list. Oh, and he said, well, it's not like, like a typical, I said, yeah, but the, what, the word is it, it that's the song that defines you to me. When you said, I want to be the, the, the pedal break that you depended on and all the lyrics of that song, that's one of my 10 favorite songs of all time. But it also, to me, that's who Eddie is. He wants to be the the, 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 uh, the pedal break yeah. that, that someone depends on and the whole thing about the, the, uh, the, the moon signing on the Camaro's hood and all. But there's a, there's a depth to him as a human being that's really astounding. And um, it really comes through uh, at times. And, uh, and all the guys in that band, I mean, there was one year that they played two out of three years at Fenway and they always let me sit up on the stage. And this one year I had, uh, I had been bitten by a, a tick uh, up in Cooperstown and those are different ticks. So it's like, <laughs> the bigger, it's the like bigger. They're very different, <laughs> different because the, the disease ends up not just um, the usual. It's partly it's about two thirds malaria. Oh, oh no. so I was really sick. Jeez. And those guys are bringing, they're playing and they're bringing me they're bringing me water. To, oh. I'm just sitting there and they're bringing me water while they're playing a concert in front of 42,000 people. <laughs> oh my God. And I'm going, this is ridiculous. <laughs> That's so great, man. It's they are, man. Pearl Jam is a band that is just if you've ever rooted for dudes that are up on stage, man, they are a band to to really uh, get behind because they really do. They care about those fans out there. Ed and all those guys remember being a fan and watching, you know, the who and and, and talking heads, all the bands that they love. So it's really cool. But it was cool a couple of years ago, bro, seeing you up there and Theo and all the guys and Bernie, how good Bernie Williams is. It's it's just phenomenal, man. And uh you know, Peter, I, this is this has really been an experience for Chich and I. You know, obviously we have a great relationship with you, but you know, just hearing you hearing you talk and hearing your stories, you know, it, it really. It, I'm very grateful. To tell you the truth, I, I'm very grateful that you're on with us. But I'm very grateful that we get to hear, you know, all the all the all the times that you've had in the game. We just want to say, man, thank you so much yeah. for your time. Um, thank you so much for your stories. And, uh, you know, just and thanks for yeah. your friendship, man. Thanks for your friendship all these years back from the Cape. And when I met you, you know, all the way to now working with you at the network. And I can't wait to see you here soon when uh, things get back going. Yeah. Well, if, and if Todd Helton makes the Hall of Fame, which I hope he does. <laughs> yeah. I yes. hope I hope you're up there in uh, Cooperstown and, and yeah. somebody can say to me, how come Sean Casey isn't in the Hall of Fame? Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be great, man. That would be great. And Todd yeah. Helton deserves to go in. I hope he does go in and I will yep. be right next to you, hopefully, when he does, Peter. Yeah. Okay. And Peter, from my end, you know, I've told you this a million times and I say it to everybody I know, but you know, uh, I've gotten a lot of accolades and stuff in my career, awards, Emmy Awards, whatever. One, one of the greatest things I can say about my career in this industry is that Peter Gammons is my friend. And uh, this really was an honor. I know we you joke with us saying, oh, whatever, I'm an honor to be with you. No, this is an honor for us to have you here today. So thank yeah. you again. We love you. And just keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you very much. It really is. Totally great friends. Yeah. All right, Peter. Thanks. Thanks a lot, man. We will see you soon, brother. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. You, thanks brother. again, man. Thank you. <laughs> wow, Chinch. I mean, that one right there. I mean, Peter's obviously a good, great friend of both of ours, and it has been there at the beginning of all our both of our careers, which is really yeah. cool. But the way he, you know, when he started going on some of his tangents into, you know, Derek Jeter, and then he was talking about Boggs and Mattingly and Ted Williams having dinner. I'm just like, what? Yeah. Carl Yastrzemski and Mike, you know, being I mean, <laughs> what comes out of Peter's mouth and the, and the history that he has in major league baseball is like literally 
I mean, uh, royalty, royalty. What do you Royalty. Have? Royalty, and I'll take it from my perspective, but like I said, I wouldn't be in this industry. There are a lot of people like me who have done a lot of things in the sports broadcasting or writing or any type of world. He saved, he created jobs. First of all, he created jobs for a lot of people back in the late 90s. People were losing their jobs as reporters uh, uh, writing for newspapers and stuff. And without Peter Gammons, those people would, would have been in a lot of more trouble. And he's created an industry for people like me and if all I say is for the younger people, you know, you see Peter now, read his story, look him up, look up the places he was on. Just listen to this podcast. Like you said, the names he knows, the people he knows, the friends he's had and the way he's carried himself is by far and away the number one thing about like the human being is a Hall of Famer. Right? We say that it's a cliche, but I'm sorry. Peter Gammons is something special that was put on this planet and has taken this game of baseball and, and, and expanded it and made it better for all of us. And we were very lucky to have him on this earth. And we were very lucky to have him on this podcast with us two yeah. jerks. In here. <laughs> oh, dude, so <laughs> thankful, man. So thankful. And Peter, thanks, man. We will see yeah. him soon. And for everybody out there that's listening, we are very grateful you're listening to us. Keep coming in the mayor's office with us. We're having a blast. Chinchi, grateful for you, brother. Um, really enjoyed this episode. And uh, if you're listening to us and you like us, download click on this click on the five star It'd be nice to give us five stars yeah, that's fun. And give us a review too if you, if, yeah. you know, if you like what we're doing give us a review and uh but i'm i'm looking forward to next week change it gets better and better my man yeah thank you buddy all right brother i will see you i'll see you next week and uh take care of yourself man it's so great you change Support this week for the mayor's office is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0, baby. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code the Mayor at manscaped.com i tell you what though i love these things change i've had them i've had manscaped 1.0 2.0 3.0 and this is the 4.0 this one it has a new sleek design it's perfect for guys like me though dude i'm one of the hairiest guys going that's a fact and, for, and as the fact and forever man forever i've been looking for the best trimmers even going way back years of when i was playing i'd always nick myself up cut myself as the worst these trimmers right here, man, they are the best. They are the absolute best. Trims up my back, trims up my arm, the jewels, whatever it takes. Yeah. But this trimmer is the absolute best. The 4.0, the lawnmower from Manscaped. I can vouch for that. I know Sean wears a sweater 24 hours a day, <laughs> 365 days a year, and he needs this. He sent me one. I'm so psyched. I shave with it. That's how good got, it is. That's how yeah, and it. Chinch, I've tried every, every one you can try, every clipper you can possibly buy. I've tried. Yeah. This by far is the best. Yeah, Sean puts the a best. clipper on his. It, it'll break the clippers, but not the manscaper. Yeah. So Every, everyone, everyone should have this, bro. Everyone yeah, well, should have one of these. They absolutely should. So here's how you get it. Okay, you get twenty percent off and free shipping with the code the mayor, right, Sean? The mayor. Yes. At manscaped.com. That's twenty percent off with free shipping. Manscaped.com and use the code the mayor. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. And you can look as clean as Casey does now. When he, <laughs> when he doesn't use a Manscaped, it's like Sasquatch. There's the, the people call it cops. Unbelievable. Lawnmower 4.0. Go get it. It's unbelievable, Chinch. <laughs> Do it.